so the plan is <laughs> I can't even say it. The plan is, welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews and to another episode in my Animorphs series. Today I am recapping, reviewing Animorphs 16. This is The Warning, and as usual, let's take a moment to appreciate this cover before we get started. Number one, I love this image. This is the funniest morph image so far. Number two, this is a rhino wearing clothes. And number three, this is a Jake book. These are the things that we have learned from this cover. If you don't know who Jake is, as ever, I'm not gonna bore you with a recap of all the characters, despite the fact that this book does that anyway, because you can just go and watch the playlist. We get our standard traditional Animorphs opening, although there is a slight twist on it in that Jake does not only not give us his real actual name, he also gives us an approximation of his screen name. He obviously can't tell us what his screen name actually is, but we get something similar. He seems embarrassed about having a username similar to bball24, but given that my first ever email address which I no longer have access to so don't be trying and hacking it was something similar to Judy Moody does something or other at Hotmail or something yeah there were worse embarrassing emails or usernames to have Jake so after giving us the rundown of all that's happening with the alien invasion Jake lets us know that he is connecting to the internet that's where this book begins and honestly this kind of technological nostalgia is why I wanted to pick this series up in the first place I connected at 38,400 bps I wish I had a faster modem but at least this one is better than my old 14440 I can remember dial up internet I'm not that young but I do not have a sense of the technology behind it I just remember knowing how to connect to the internet bpm doesn't mean anything to me. BPM? BPS. BPM is beats per minute. Yeah. After dealing with some spam and a delightful email from Marco pretending to be Cassie, I'll let you imagine how terrible that email was. Jake on a whim searches for Yik. Only one search result comes up. Now just for comparison's sake, I did a similar search and... Yeah, a fair few more. I clicked on the blue hypertext link and suddenly I realised we Animorphs were not as alone as we'd thought. In lieu of the usual trip to the barn that we would normally get at this point in order to debrief, we're instead at Marco's house because they need his dad's computer and super fast internet in order to explore this particular plot thread. It's definitely quite fun reading this and being allied with Axe, which isn't something that normally happens, but just in the sense of, oh my goodness, 90s internet was so slow. This page is devoted to letting the world know about the Yik threat. This is not a joke. This is not the usual internet nonsense. This is serious. This is deadly serious. So this site has a few pages, one of which includes a drawing that's probably an approximation of a hawk bajir. Cassie nodded her agreement. A mix of truth and lies, or else a coincidence. A mix of truth and lies is like the definition of the internet, Rachel said. Equal parts reality and delusion. That ratio of equal parts has definitely shifted. <laughs> They're having a look down a list on the website of people who are probably controllers, and some of them are a bit far-fetched. The Spice Girls, for example. But then Vice Principal Chapman is on the list, so there again is some truth to this website. But then why doesn't the page mention the sharing? How odd, unless this is in fact a yerk trap. But then why mention Chapman? Wheels within wheels. There's a scheduled chat happening on the site at around about that time, and between Marco's hacker skills and Axe's actual alien technology knowledge skills, they should be able to make a secure enough connection that they can join the chat without being found out. The chat is basically incomprehensible internet speak. It's all written out, it's quite entertaining, but then one person mentions the sharing, and another chat person immediately shuts it down, says, no, no, I already checked it out, the sharing is fine, nobody, do not ask me any more questions. But the original person, Chaz, is adamant that the sharing is a yerk front. He's not wrong. It is. Based on the way the chat is going, it really feels like this is a yerk front with a few genuine people involved. So they need to be able to find out who the more legitimate people are. Now, Marco can't hack into this one, but to be fair, neither can Axe, so I guess it's actually secure. This machine and the central computer are both too primitive. I tried to reconfigure the software, but it is not enough, he brightened. However, I fixed it so Marco will now be able to win any online computer game he plays. I already win every game. Marco lied. Your win and lose ratio is stored in the computer, Marco. Axe pointed out, you do not win every game. You win 42% of the time. Making fun of Marco aside, this has to be one of the most stupid plans yet. So the plan is, <laughs> I can't even say it, the plan is to invade Web Access America and to, in their file system, find the names behind the people in the chat room. But the location of Web Access America is too far away, even in Bird Morph, so they need to go and get on a plane. I'm just gonna say it, this plan is silly even by Animorph standards. All we have to do is morph, fly aboard the plane and try not to get swatted, and demorph when we get there. We can take United or Northwest. Surely nothing will go wrong. So they're gonna morph fly and go on the aeroplane. Update on the last episode, Tobias has since acquired a fly morph, so that's not an issue here. This is relevant because they need to be flies to get on the plane without buying plane tickets. But flies have terrible eyesight, or really strange eyesight, and they mostly fly around by sense of smell. All I'm gonna say is that the plan to find 
the smell of the plane involves finding a diaper and yeah it's not good just if you read it you'll know and if not you don't need to worry they get on the plane but before that they need a safe place to morph and let's not forget that to do that Axe has to demorph into his andalite self <laughs> morphing fly is gross enough but doing it in a public bathroom means that you're running the risk of somebody opening the door while you're halfway through a, through a fly morph and being utterly scarred for life they were here i'm telling you monsters like weird mutated things Sir, just how many drinks did you have on your flight? A lot of the time people who catch the Animorphs mid-morph are just being blamed as being drunk. It's fine. Tobias, who has never morphed fly before because practicing is for dorks, gets a little bit caught up in the smorgasbord of smells that is a public bathroom. And then he gets stuck in the toilet under somebody's butt. Tobias, I think for the sake of safety and also for the sake of avoiding something way too gross to even think about, you need to get out of there. How? How? The exit is blocked, to say the least. Try the space between the toilet seat and the porcelain. Oh, look for the light. There will be some light shining through, I said. Go into the light, Marco said. Despite all of this nonsense, they do manage to make it onto the plane. Though the timing is slightly tight in terms of getting on the plane, getting off the plane, demorphing safely and not getting stuck as flies forever. Unfortunately, they aren't very good at being subtle flies. Like all they have to do is sit still for an hour and a half or so. And Marco gets caught eating some guy's steak, steak on a plane, and the flight attendants get a little bit fly swatter happy. I felt the massive hand press violently down on me. I had been swatted. I was in the crack of the hand's lifeline, and just because of that tiny indentation, I had not died, but I was shattered. My left wing was gone, ripped away. My right wing barely moved. I was blind in my right eye. Four of my legs were broken, but by far the worst was that my body, my green black body, had burst open, but there was no pain. No pain. Just terror. Jake is legitimately dying, and he cannot do morph because he is in the middle of a plane. Thankfully, Cassie has the presence of mind to persuade the others to fly down and airlift Jake out of there, and into the bathroom where he can demorph in peace. And nobody notices that one more person gets off the plane than got onto it. It's all fine. So they're off the plane, and despite being a little bit shaken up, they have a trip to Taco Bell, Axe gets a little bit too excited about hot sauce and they get thrown out of the Taco Bell, and then it's time to go to the Web Access America building. You might think, how on earth are they going to get in? But it turns out they do tours. So they're ambling about with this group of elderly people just enjoying the tour, I imagine, and they find the command center. Rachel makes a pretty good observation. It's daytime. There are people around. This isn't how we usually do things. It's usually night. But she follows that up with a much less good plan. We could create a distraction, set the place on fire, then when everyone runs, thankfully Jake is there to remind her that endangering people by setting an office building on fire is probably not the best option. Like it's probably not a good idea to set fire to nice normal people. Then it popped into my head, that's the morph nice normal people. In some ways I'm excited for this idea and in some ways I'm I'm confused as to how we've got through 16 books without them morphing people yet. Get used to disappointment. And then in a move that I wasn't expecting they discuss the ethics and morality of morphing into other people because those people cannot consent to their DNA being stolen. The whole reason we're fighting is to keep people free I said. If we start violating that and using people's DNA without permission we may not be as bad as the Yerks but we're heading down that same path. We have to find another way. A valid point but a boring one. <laughs> so they're falling back on the classic animals plan of create a big distraction and hope nobody looks behind them. Just one slight problem Jake, Rachel pointed out, who's going to open the door of this closet? They've been hidden in a closet, I hope that's clear at this point. So in the closet at the moment is a bear, a hawk, a tiger and a skunk, none of which have hands that can open a closet door. So of course Rachel just busts the door down because she's badass. 50 or 60 sets of eyes had swiveled at once to stare up at us and what they saw kept them watching. Rachel, huge, terrifying, powerful Rachel, was calmly mopping the floor swinging the mop back and forth like a professional. I was helping. I had the mop bucket in my teeth. The employees are, unsurprisingly, surprised by this. <laughs> Have we gone nuts? I'm not nuts. It's the bear who's nuts. That's carpeted up there. Yeah, let's fact check the bear doing the mopping's actions. <laughs> Marco takes advantage of the distraction to go and get the information that they need, which will surely not be password protected. That's all fine. But then two men with handguns have turned up to deal with the bear and the tiger. They take out the guards, not by beating them to death. Don't worry about that. It's the skunk spray that deals with these guards. The elevator door slid open. There was an executive and a bike messenger on it. They decided to get off when we crowded into the elevator. Rachel jabbed a claw at the button for the lobby and by the time we got there the only people on the elevator were four kids wearing tight clothes and cheap shoes. Will the CCTV mystery ever be solved? Because I feel like if anywhere has access to cutting edge CCTV it's an internet company, right? <sighs> The distraction was so good that Marco, the creepy, creepy, creepy man, had some time to look at some other usernames. This girl whose screen name is PartyGirl802, she sends me like these very flirty kind of emails and IM messages, you know. She likes me and all. 
So you found out who she is? Cassie asked. That's not very nice. Yeah, no kidding. It wasn't nice. I found out my online girlfriend, Party Girl 802 is actually a 73-year-old retired postal worker. Let's not dwell on that idea for too long. Teach your children internet safety. But one name from that Yik chat room does stick out in particular. The billionaire owner of Web Access America, who doesn't conceal his identity within his own workplace, Joe Bob Fenestra, Marco's hero. They're back at the airport and they need to get back on the plane. And understandably, Jake is a little bit concerned about going back into a fly morph, given that he almost died, you know, within the last 24 hours. Cassie looked at me and shook her head. What's the matter with you? You don't have to do this. You don't have to prove how tough you are. It's not a problem, Cassie. Thanks, but let it go, okay? Jake, you may have the others fooled, but not me. You're scared. You have a good reason to be scared. So what's the big deal? The big deal is apparently that Jake is concerned because he has to be the leader and therefore he cannot be scared ever because leadership. He can't let fear tell him what to do because a leader needs the people he is leading to tell him what to do or something like that. What a delightfully toxic view of leadership, but it does give us some insight into Jake's character. But they make it home without anyone nearly dying and Jake gets home to find his brother, the controller, on the phone, presumably to another controller. So now the thinking begins, is Fenestra their window into the Yik world or is this another trap? But no time for that, it's time for a terribly awkward family dinner where Jake is fully aware that the Yik in his brother's brain is coming up with things to say. It's not fun. Jake ends it with a nice normal thought. The day will come, Yik, when I will tear you out of his head and destroy you for what you've done to my family. <sighs> Meanwhile, Marco has been up to a lot of hacking using the program that Axe installed for him. He's gone back to the chat room where one of the chatters, someone who they've discovered is just a nine-year-old, because that's fine, is thinking about confronting his father who he believes to be a controller. So who did they contact? Did they contact the child? Did they contact the one who probably might be a yik, but then there's a real name attached to that account. Do they go for the billionaire? All right, plan. First things first, they're gonna see how the billionaire is doing. And then they'll go after the nine-year-old later. That was a sentence. You know what I mean. This guy knows how to live, Marco said with satisfaction. Someday that'll be me. Who'll be you? The guy mowing the lawn down there, Rachel said. Round one to Rachel. <laughs> in case it wasn't clear, they've gone to the billionaire's mansion. Okay, first of all, we go in like Tobias said, only Tobias stays outside and uses his eyes and ears to report what he sees through the window. Inside, half of us morph to fly, the others to cockroach. We spread out and keep in touch by thought speak. Anyone finds Finestra, he calls the others, okay? Other than the part where they change morph halfway through, I'm down with this plan. Demorphing, never a good decision. But then... Shoot them! What? The birds? Yes, the birds! Those are the orders! Uh-oh. There are armed men and dogs and Axe has been hit. Everything is going terribly wrong. Rachel and Axe have been captured and it's all Jake's fault. They're still in bird form. It's okay, they've not been captured as humans. It seems as though Finestra is a controller and this has all been a trap. And the clock is ticking to get Rachel and Axe out of there before Rachel's humanity is discovered. I don't know what to do. It came out as a sob. I hadn't planned it. Hadn't meant to say it. The character growth. Admitting defeat. Okay, time for Jake reasoning time. These are probably humans and not controllers, because controllers would use hawk bajir and dragon beams and not guns and dogs. So it's probably safe for them to bust in and do the rescue. We don't have any morphs between us that are fast enough and tough enough to bust into that place without getting shot up. But I do have an idea. How far are we from the gardens? Gardens, combination zoo theme park, and based on the cover, I have a feeling which morph we're gonna go and get. It's Rhino, in case that wasn't clear, or you skipped the first minute of this video for some reason. <laughs> so Jake lands on a rhino's back as a bird and then morphs human, acquires a rhino's DNA, all with very minimal incident given how badly it could have gone. And they just sort of pop back to where their friends have been captured. It's very uneventful for acquiring a morph. You were right to not try and sneak inside in some kind of insect morph. There's a band of poison around each door and some kind of bug zapper in the window that must be what shocked Rachel. I think Mr. Fenestra has some psychological problems. If he's aware of an alien invasion, this feels like a good amount of caution to have. Practice morphing Rhino? Nah. This seems like a good time to just go for it without any preparation. They manage to not laugh at Jake, who presumably looks like this, which is an achievement in my book. Ten minutes to go before everything goes terribly wrong, and Jake manages to persuade the pretty calm Rhino mind to charge at the gate. He gets through the gate, through the other gate, past the fences, past the dogs, only to be spotted by the guys with shotguns who might be a legitimate concern. But as the book tells us, you need a better kind of bullet to take out a rhino. And Jake manages to beat up the guards enough to charge at the door. Well, 
He hits the wall, but it's enough for them to get through. Jake, open this door, Marco would say. I'd turn where he showed me, shove my massive bony face forward, and the door would explode in splinters. Jake's a better door opener than a leader. I'll say it. They rampage around the mansion for a bit, but then they realise that they probably just need to go to wherever is most heavily guarded. I was hit. I staggered. I felt the bullet from the handgun tear into my right shoulder. A second slug lodged in the bone of my face. I feel like the violence factor has really gone up a notch in this book. Presumably hedging his bets that no one is looking and there are no cameras, Jake starts to demorph because, you know, gotta deal with the fact he's been shot in the face. He calls out for Rachel and Axe as he still has the last little bits of thought speak left. Axe, demorph, time's up. But there are humans here watching me, Prince Jake. Another decision. Just do it, Axe. We're coming for you. I just kept thinking, this wasn't even supposed to be a very dangerous mission, and now we were as close to being wiped out as we'd ever been. Back into morph, tiger mode this time. They need to find Rachel and Axe. And instead, they only find guards. One carried a shotgun, the other a small submachine gun. They were 30 feet away. For a frozen moment, nobody moved. I could cover 30 feet in two seconds. In those same two seconds, the guy with the machine gun could fire 10 rounds. He could easily kill me. If he failed, the force of my leap, my desperate need to defend myself would ensure that he died. So Jake does what he thinks is best and thought speaks to the guard. The guard reflects that he's probably not being paid enough to fight a psychic wolf and a psychic tiger, and he decides to probably just leave it. Marco opens the door to reveal what seems to be a room with the sky above it, and a shallow pool that looks like it's filled with lead, and some cages with Axe and Rachel still in morph. My tiger eyes were very good, my tiger ears were good too, I heard no heartbeat from her, I saw no slight movement of her chest rising and falling with breathing. Oh yeah, and there's Joe Fenestra with his dragon beam pointed directly at Axe. But he seems to indicate that he's not with the Yerks or the Andalites, and that he's put Axe and Rachel in biostasis, and he thinks that they're both just Andalites, which is a fair assessment at this point. Why would I kill you? I'm a yik, he said, a controller, although my host and I are on very good terms. I made him rich, I wrote his famous web browser, we've been partners all these years. Yicks don't have partners, I said. I'm ruddy confused and I read the thing, don't yell at me for the fact that this doesn't make sense. My yik designation is Esplin 9466, note the double six, do you know what it means? No. A double designation means that I'm a twin, that two yerks grew from the same grub. So this yerk is the lesser twin, like uh, the way the Romans named their twins, like John and not John. He's the not John of this situation. His brother, who is not yet named, is power hungry. Whereas this yerk made Web Access America to make Fenestra rich. And for the crime of being too valuable and powerful, his twin brother cut him off from the Candrona, which in theory is a death sentence. Who is this brother? Can you guess who his brother is? Can you? <gasps> it's Visa 3! And now I understood why his brother, this yerk living in the head of Joe Bob Fenestra, would instruct his men to shoot at birds and any other animal they saw. Any one of them might be Visa 3 in morph. Joe Bob the yerk claims to have found a way for the yerk to live inside a human without Candrona rays. This sounds suspicious to say the least. My brother has not killed me because I have information he wants and needs. He doesn't want me dead. He wants me in his torture chamber aboard his blade ship. You see, I have found a way to survive without the Candrona, and Visa 3 would give anything to know how. So it would seem that this Yerk has found a way to make edible Candrona, which could change everything because if the Yerks don't have to go back to the Yerk pool to recharge themselves, then there's really no time when they're weak. Uh, but this method's not that likely to catch on. You see, to do it, you kind of need to eat other Yerks. We aren't here to annihilate this guy, I said. I told him we wouldn't. Do you know what he's doing? Do you understand? Cassie cried. I know, I know, I know, I screamed in frustration, but I told him he would save. I promised. Besides, no. Don't say it, Jake. If you say that, I won't be able to deal with you anymore, so don't say it. So yeah, Jake has made promises to the cannibal, and this has made complicated feelings between him and Cassie. <laughs> I feel like when you make a promise to a murderer, then maybe the promise isn't super binding anymore, but maybe that's just me. But Jake lets him live, on the understanding that if they catch him again, he is toast. And he turns off the biostasis and they run out while Axe and Rachel demorph. Was that guy a controller or not? Rachel demanded. Was he a good guy or a bad guy? I laughed a little. My eyes locked with Cassie's and then we both looked away, unwilling to make contact. Rachel, I don't even know which I am anymore. Moral complexity for days. Cassie isn't at school the next Day and Jake realises she's gone after that nine-year-old from before. As in, she's gone to warn him, she's not going to kill the nine-year-old. So Jake seeks out Cassie and gets her to explain. I told him I was a magic talking wolf. He didn't exactly buy that. I guess by his age they're pretty much past the point where they believe in magic. Yeah, I guess so. I told him not to go to that chat room again. I told him... Her lip quivered suddenly. I told him not to talk to his father about yikes. Told him not to... Her voice was strangled. She gritted her teeth and squeezed out the last few words. I told that little boy not to trust his father. Cassie and Jake make up while splinting a deer's broken leg, which is, you know, the most romantic of activities. And Joe Fenestra's mansion burns down, and it's 
clear who is at fault for this, the Yicks or the Animorphs, but Jake's promise was that Joe Finestra would be safe so long as he was in his mansion, and he isn't anymore, so I guess it's open season on Yick cannibals or something. And that's where the book ends. <laughs> this one is intense, mainly I think because the internet stuff is funny to me, and then you get into real, like, ethics of war, and I have to say I am now up to book 18 in my reading, and yeah, it keeps going in this direction. Get hyped. <laughs> I just love the idea of people working in an office for the internet with, just with everyone's name next to their username and it has to be your real name. Like how are they, how are they doing that? I would love to know. <laughs> so this is the last Animals video of March. It's the only Animorphs video of March, but a reminder that next month it will be Animorphs April and we will have an Animorphs video for every single week. I think it's going to be every Wednesday, so if you haven't already subscribed, please do subscribe because I would love to have you stick around and I produce a lot of other non-Animorphs content. Hoo -hoo! And if you have commented anything about Megamorphs, please go down and delete that comment now. I don't want to hear it! Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. It's gonna be some bloopers now. I clicked on the boot. <laughs> so they need to be able to...